the Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Hiya! So this is a good start. I translated the title of my talk into emoji. Um, but, but I did it on a Mac, so now it doesn't work. So today we're going to learn book emoji, thinking emoji, money bag emoji, talk to someone emoji, happy emoji. Or in other words, what you need to know before spending money on language learning. And if you just saw Alex's talk, um, three things went through my mind. Number one, oh, crumbs. Oh God, I can't follow that up. Um, <laughs> number two is um, about halfway through, Alex was talking about, well, you know, really, you know, you've got to create a need in order to speak a language, and most of us don't really have that need, and kind of, if you've been doing it for five years, there's sort of no point, and I was like, okay, does anyone still want to learn a language? <laughs> so I'm very grateful to Alex, because he turned it around. So here's what we're going to talk about today in detail. We're going to talk about, oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to just quickly talk you through something called the one page plan and I really like, I, re I was really grateful then in the end to Alex because he, I feel like he managed to sort of set this up quite well as in the need and the need in a lot of our personal cases being personal commitment to learning a language. A uh, little bit about just me really is that I teach German. I have a very loud voice. <laughs> Um, um, and the microphone doesn't really work. Can you touch that? Can you touch the, the, the red button? Did I touch the microphone? No. No, the red button. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. 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 Hello. 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 It's back again. Oh, goddamn. Yeah, well, which one? No. No, this is. <laughs> I, 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 I like this one. Ask, now. I, I <laughs> It's off, it's off again. Take that one. I did this talk once in a German school, um, and these there was like a really large group, and the teacher was um, the microphone wasn't working, and the teacher was like, "Is okay, sie ist doch mit einem sehr lauten Organ gesegnet." <laughs> <laughs> Means I'm blessed with a very loud organ. <laughs> okay, so we're doing. We're, I'll just quickly talk you through something called the one page plan for language learning, which I think sets up your planning really nicely. And I'm talking about how you guys, or at least the people that took my online survey, budget. A little bit about budgeting and the idea of setting a budget. When is your money well spent? And then I want to have a special kind of look at making tutors worth your money, working with tutors, um, when is it worthwhile, and the whole, you know, I mean, there is italki, there's um, tandem, there's so much available and I think we all can we all can completely commit to the fact that if you're going to learn a language, you've got to talk to a person at some point, so this is about um, questions you can ask those people to really make it worth your money. I've been tutoring German on the internet for about four years um, and I've also taught groups, so I've worked with like a, quite a range of people, from people who are prepping for an exam to my longest standing student who's been with me for like, three years and I think I am his need in a way, <laughs> now, um, which comes back to this commitment thing, I think that's really important in a way. Okay, so the one page plan, I didn't write this, um, it's written by <coughs> language surfer Ron Gullickson, and I just really want to give credit to Ron, who's a, a wonderful, wonderful, was a wonderful writer about language learning, kind of wrote like a little book, and he's sort of in the language blogging community, um, was a guy I really, really looked up to. We've got to talk to about him in the past tense now, which is really sad, but you know, if you can read his work at languagesurfer.com, and that was an awesome guy. Okay, so Ron came out with this, and I saw it and I thought, oh my god, this is so great. So this is the one page language plan, which I think really sets it up really nicely if you're taking on a new language project. And it breaks it down into your goals. So here we have your current level and your goal level. And he put this into the CEFR levels, which is one way of going about it. But then also set other language goals. 
um, it obviously makes sense to make your goal time bound as well. So when you kind of say, I'm going to go from A1 to B1, it <coughs> might help to say, do you want to do that in the month of May or do you want to, <laughs> I don't know, this week? <laughs> or, or, you know, or are you taking your time? So you may want to also time bind your goal, but I thought it's really a good way of sitting down and going, what is it that I actually want here? Um, and then we're getting into a budgeting section, and the budgeting section looks at money, but also, I know there's a thingy where you do the laser thing, but are you okay with me just finger pointing at this? Okay, cool. Um, I'm old. <laughs> um, but also has your time commitment there. So you're committing money and you're committing time, which immediately is kind of, one of gonna be one of the core messages that I'm looking at today, is, is time is money, money is time and all that palaver. Um, and then you kind of write down your materials that you're going to be using, which again, writing it down, typing it up or whatever, it's a commitment. Um, so we've got your goals, your budget, your time, your materials, and finally the strategies that you're going to be using. Um, and I really like, again, I'm core skills girl, core skills mad, I think they're really, really, really important. So it's looking at all four core skills. So say your goal was an exam in a specific language, or even say your goal was like C1 or one of those advanced levels that Gareth was talking about yesterday. Um, there he is, hasn't run off yet. Um, <laughs> I think this is a really great way of getting it all onto one page without overthinking stuff. Okay, so say you've set your budget or you've spent some money. So how do you know it's money well spent? And this is one of my kind of really important messages here is Money spent on language learning, money spent on a tutor, money spent on books, money spent on a polyglot gathering. <laughs> it, it isn't a guarantee of pretty much anything, right? You can throw, and we all, like, if anybody, I don't know, has anyone in this room ever bought a Rosetta Stone? No. You're all like, no! <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, but I've met people who've bought a Rosetta Stone, and they're quite expensive. Um, but they're not a guarantee, you know, they're not going to make you magically, nothing, sadly, nothing beams languages in your brain. Summer courses don't, quick courses don't, nothing seems to do it. But money spent, and this is, I'm grateful to Alex for mentioning this first, is, is a commitment, right? Because making money appear in your bank account means spending time, usually, um, means working hard, and then where you put that money, I think, means where you want to put your attention and where you want to put your time. So money spent on language learning means you made a commitment to language learning. Now here are a few quotes from the survey that I took where I asked people, did you think your money was well spent? That was really lovely. Um, Caroline, or Caroline um, said, it was all very useful, quite nice, but keeping myself motivated and focused going back to that, you know, like making myself need to do this was the key through it all. And that, you can't buy that. You just can't, you know, you can, you can spend money and that kind of does it a little bit for you, but it's not really, you can't actually go out and buy like motivation juice. Um, <laughs> Red Bull might do it. <laughs> um, and then what's typically missing in language products, I think that was the biggest thing, which is why I wanted to go into tutoring, is personalization. And that was a theme that also came back through this. Okay. Now, I don't know, ha have any of you guys set yourself a budget for, you know, before you started like, I'm going to learn French and I'm going to spend 100 euros on this. Have you ever done this? See, I, it, it's, you are in the minority, as you can tell. And I mean, there's, maybe they lied when they were doing this. <laughs> or it's, you know, self-selecting people who take a survey about budgets. So, but 57% of people in the survey said no. Um, and that to me was like, yeah, of course, because I've never done that either. Um, but when you do budget, when you think about it, what it means is you plan ahead because it makes you think about where is that money going to go? Where is that time going to go? It makes you commit. This word is going to be said a lot today, you can tell. Um, and it makes you use your time effectively because you knew in advance that that's what you were going to spend your time on. So I am actually, as I thought about this more, I'm actually now in favor of actually taking that little bit of time and setting a budget for language learning. A time budget, perhaps, a financial budget, but really kind of going at the start, okay, I'm going to 
get from here to there next three months and I'm spending 20 euros. And then, because then the next question really nicely becomes what am I going to spend my 20 euros on, which then makes you think about it before Amazon tells you what to do. You know, like you do what you do instead of Amazon or Christian's blog or anybody else's. You know, like whatever it is that you invest in, it makes it more worthwhile because you've actually been the person in control who made the decision. Okay, so here is how the learners in my survey spend their budget. We've got, I, I really like this, um, IRL lessons, in real life lessons, so one-to-one -one lessons and group lessons. And when you take a class in person, it seems that there's still more people taking group lessons, significantly more like people taking group lessons than one-to-one -one lessons. Online lessons, totally on the rise. Online courses, this is what I would usually consider a video course, so perhaps something like where you purchase a set of videos and then in your own time you can kind of work through them or it may be a guided course where you actually get some contact time but you're in the course with several people so i think in a way the add one challenge would also fall under online courses although it's a lot more self-guided in a way okay uh, books and ebooks everybody buys books almost almost everybody buys books um and i thought apps was really interesting because i think hands up if you're using an app on your phone to learn a language. Like, yeah, it's, it's pretty much all of you, um, except for this side. <laughs> You're old. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of apps operate on a free or freemium model, so that might be why people don't invest enough, well, no, not enough, but that's why people don't really invest financially in those. So a few findings that I thought were interesting is that online lessons are now an online one-to-one -one, most likely. Um, online lessons are now more popular than offline one-to-one -one lessons, which is good news for online tutors. <laughs> but it also kind of makes sense because, again, we're thinking about committing not just money but committing time, and online lessons tend to be a lot more convenient. Also foreigners, they live in like foreign countries, and then that way you can make foreigners come to you with the magic of the internet. Um, nearly everyone invests in books and e-books which for me at least was really pleasant to see. Um, okay, this is, go again, going from the anecdotal question, did you think your money was well spent after, after this previous question on a budget? People report really high satisfaction. So they said, oh yeah, that no, was really brilliant. What I bought was really great. Report really high satisfaction when they purchase what they research. So if people kind of circle something for a little bit or Gareth was saying the word Liebeugeln yesterday, which I think is, is really nice. So Liebeugeln is like in German when you're kind of making eyes at something for a little while. Um, and then you purchase. Then the satisfaction level, based on my complete non-representative survey, is really high. Um, and finally, six out of nine lesson takers were very satisfied with their tutor. Which brings me to, you know, again, later on, you've got to think about what you're hiring a tutor for and how you're going to get that person to do what you want them to do. So a quick step-by-step -step of budgeting, really. Assess your time frame and your goal. Set yourself a range, right? I, I'm, I'm not a I'm not commitment girl. I really I have a big issue making decisions. So when I th was thinking about this, um, about my own kind of language learning goals and stuff, I would really struggle to say, like, I'm going to spend 27 euro 50 because I would feel really bad if I went over my own budget. So my recommendation would actually be to set yourself a range equally with time. You know, we can't spend 15 minutes every day. Maybe we can't spend an hour every day on learning a language. But you might be able to kind of go between half an hour and an hour and a half. And that way, if you're that kind of person, you might feel a lot more comfortable with what you're setting yourself as a goal. And it might feel a lot more achievable. You do, lo you do lose that precision that could hold you to it. Um, assess what you need help with. Right, so actually think about your weaknesses, which comes from that core skill assessment at the start in the one-page language plan. And then for number four, research your options. Okay, that much for that. And now I want to talk you through a few ideas about tutors and working with tutors. I come with this from mostly the tutor's perspective, who has taken on a lot of people and kind of worked with them online and certainly tried to be worth their money, definitely. And one thing I learned as a tutor is that 
I just can't teach anyone German. I can sort of be there and explain and be their like companion and make them learn German or help them learn German. Um, but I can't actually teach anyone German because that would mean I would, I don't know, like, the uh, accusative, no, no, no. You know, it's just like, it's, it's beyond my responsibility as a tutor to actually beam the accusative in your head and make you use it correctly all the time. And then I would feel like I've taught you this. Brilliant, yeah, I get a tick in my book. But it's actually, it's actually not like that. And equally, as you, as a learner, I see Lydia's nodding over there, because I know your talk is, you know, don't teach me, make me learn. I think that's really important. So for you as the learner, what that means is even if you're spending uh, $8 million on tutor extraordinaire, if you were to get, I don't know, Alex Rawlings himself to teach you a language, and, and you're paying him so much that he's actually like, bringing his whole harem of ladies down around your house. And <laughs> he's not here anymore, so I can't, you know. But, you know, like, even if, even if you're like the Sultan of Brunei kind of, if you have all the riches and all the time in the world, they, you know, they're still not going to be able to teach you a language. Uh, sorry. Um, you've got to learn it yourself, at which point it becomes about what is it that you're actually hiring a person for? Because there is still a point in hiring someone, I think. Okay, otherwise I'd have a problem. Um, so, this is, a, this is a quote from Judith, um, who we all know. So, any one-to-one language session lesson should be led by either the tutor or the student. I think this is really interesting. Um, so, an inexperienced learner should look for an experienced tutor, and vice versa. And this room probably mostly full of experienced learners, but it may also be that there are other reasons why you just can't take the responsibility to lead each lesson or to lead your language learning journey. So even if you're on language five and you kind of know how this works, you may just need them, you may just want them to carry a little bit for you. But I really like this idea of the, the not just the lesson, but I think the, the general kind of the next three months, like the goal achievement process is usually led by either the tutor or the student. Um, I really like that. Okay, so going from that, we've got two types of lessons, right? We've got a practice session type thing, which is for the smart polyglot who knows what she's doing. Uh, or in, in other words, really, if you know what you're doing, you kind of know, like, I know how to, you know, I know my writing isn't good. I know I need to get my writing to this stage. I, I kind of, you know, like, I've got it all mapped out, what I really want here. Um, so you do have to have confidence and you've got to be organized because that's usually that usually means you're not really gonna feel like doing the homework that your tutor sets you um, or something like that um, and if you've ever tried to teach something to a teacher uh, <laughs> you may have you may have realized you know what that means because there is kind of that mutual confidence and leadership um, and you've got to decide who is in charge so I think with a practice session that means you're in charge and this tends to translate, say, for example, in an Italki environment, this tends to translate into, I'm looking for someone to practice this language with me. Um, a lot of people who are looking for a conversation partner, speaking practice, language exchanges, they're all in this area. The other bit is the tutoring session, which, you know, like, this is a polyglot gathering. No, none of you need this, right? Except perhaps if you are really busy and you've got where other things going on in your life besides language learning maybe you've got a full-time job that's got nothing to do with this you've got family i don't know you are learning how to drive or cook or whatever um you know you just have other things going on but you you're ready to kind of in a way surrender a little bit of your own control and kind of commit to the leadership of another or this is also if you've just got real confidence if in that person if they should really convince you and you're like, yeah, no, I want to work with you because you totally know what's going on with it. So if you want confidence, guidance and explanations, I think really this is for anyone who wants a bit of, you know, who wants to improve their grammatical areas, I think this is really good. But like Gareth says, it's, it's kind of a waste of time getting your tutor to read out the grammar book to you. However, I've... I, you know, as a German tutor, I do a lot of reading out the grammar book, um, and I've, I've very many times come across situations where 
being um, me being there, me understanding, say, the dative or something like that, and the whole thing where when you use accusative and dative or any insert any like foreign language complication, um, and then being able to focus on it directly with that student and perhaps talking about things that are going on in their life, and then also. I think being in front of them and them having to face me and me sitting there and kind of going, no, no, you're going to do this now. We're going to do this thing. We're going to do this thing. And then repeating the sentences with them. Um, that that's really helped them. And people say, okay, well, I looked at this many, many, many times and I finally get it. Or I feel like I finally get it. <laughs> it's not the same thing. It's a shame. Um, you know, so even if you want explanations that, you know, and the grammar book explanations aren't working for you, it may be that it helps to just get a person to kind of talk you through it once again. This is also to do with cognitive processing, because sometimes when you hear it and you have to respond to it, it's, it, you know, your brain is forced to go through it differently than if you were doing this with a grammar book or if you're listening to a podcast about it or God knows what. Okay, so this requires patience from you, and it requires collaboration. But if you are ready to go for the tutoring session, then that is really the type. And I think you've got to communicate to your tutor what sort of thing you want at the start. So the question in the survey was, if I could wave a magic wand and give you the best tutor or coach in the world, what would they do? And so this is kind of a word cloud from that, and some, what I really noticed was what we saw earlier, which was the idea of personalization. So people really want, from a tutor, they want personalized attention. They don't want grammar book and whatever, you know, like I've done that before. I want, so people, the word weaknesses came up a lot. I mean, obviously the word language came up a lot. <laughs> it's, it's not the maths um, tutor questions, but you know, people said, address my weaknesses, like, you know, like, talk to me, see what my problem is, fix my problem with me. Um, people want time, and by time they also meant the commitment, you know, so what they're also saying is, I want somebody to be there and wait for me once a week, twice a week, because that is going to mean I'm doing this thing now. Um, and the other thing that I really liked in this was, where's it at? Motivate, right? So they want, and fun is in there somewhere as well. So a lot of people said, I want kind of entertainment with my language. I want you to bring this to life, which I re again really fits in nicely with what Alex was saying about the need principle. You know, if you don't understand a joke in a foreign language, you might feel a stronger need than if you don't understand, like, where is your passport? No, no, no. And you kind of don't really care what people are saying. But if you kind of feel like, <coughs> Especially if you were to feel left out, if you feel like, oh, I don't get it, I don't get it, hang on, let me work on this and get it. Um, I think that's also a tutor's rule, kind of to make you more aware of what you're not getting. Um, so, how can we then, <coughs> press buttons, okay, how can we then, from all those needs, and this is really, I didn't want to kind of say, here is what you must need from a tutor, but I think doing that exercise with yourself is really useful if you're going to go and spend money on somebody who's practicing a language with you. So just go like, if my tutor was like the best ever, what would they do? And there were some really cynical answers in this. There was also like, this person always goes over the agreed time, she never charges me extra. <laughs> okay, works for you. Um, so it really is personal to you. And you've really got to think, you know, like, what's going to make this value for money? What's going to make this value for time for you? So you don't feel like, well, you know, that wasn't really anything. And it's more than tutoring the language. So here are a few things that I think you should do when you're contacting your tutor. This is what um, dream students really do, I think, for tutors um, and for anyone that you work with. Number one, take responsibility for your own learning. Because sadly, no matter how much you may pay me, I'm not going to teach you German. I'm going to be there and help you as you learn German, hopefully, um, or whatever it is that you're wanting to learn, if I can help, if I can support, if I can explain, if I can guide and give knowledge, totally will, but I, I can't actually really teach you German as much as I'd like to. Um, no one's ever going to hire me again, are they? <laughs> okay. Um, 
Number two, the more you say at the start, especially at the start of the relationship, because that is when you're totally in charge, um, the better your lesson is going to be. So this is about communication. So three things that I totally want, want to hear from Mr. Dream student. Um, number one, how long have you been learning this language? And not just like, oh, but, but it, it does kind of, you know, people, people never answer that question with like, a year. And then they stop because that, that opens up a whole, where are you at now? How much time are you spending on it at the moment? Um, has it been going well? Have there been frustrations? So I think there's more to this than just giving a time span, but just, you know, like tell them the story of your language learning because it's actually interesting to a tutor. Um, number two, what does your version of a one page plan look like? You know, so we think about your budget in terms of time, your budget in terms of money, your goals, where are your weaknesses, what is it that you're trying to do, what is it that you're trying to get. And then finally, what is it that you're looking for, which is that idea of, you know, what would the perfect tutor do for you? Because we are all different and we're all, you know, like humans and language tutor is not the same as language tutor. So different... Um, especially online teachers who tend to be um, self-employed, individual, uh, you know, you're know, you not following a set curriculum, which is a huge advantage, but you've got to make it an advantage. So tell them what you're looking for, tell them what you're trying to achieve. So what I'm saying here is make them an accomplice, you know, instead of a tool. Don't treat, you know, people do this sometimes with the native speaker. It's like, I need a book, I need a uh, podcast, and I need a native speaker. Like as if a native speaker is a tool, um, but actually they're a person. And equally, your tutor is going to be is a person, um, and that means you you want to get them on your side, right? You want to get them in on your mission so that they can go, yeah, totally, let's do this. Um, number two, ask them a lot of questions. You know, like job interview, you're in charge. Maybe put on a suit. Um, how long? How frequent are your lessons? Which I would assume most good tutors would then answer with. Well, based on what you need, this is what we do. Um, have you worked with my type of situation before? They don't, maybe that's not entirely necessary, but it can kind of tell you how they've approached, you know, similar situations in the past. What kind of lesson structure would you suggest for my situation? Actually, maybe ask this first and this second. Um, but these are suggestions, of course. So and then what's your approach? You know, are you strict? Are you relaxed? Not just in turning up on time, because I think that's a given um, for your own sake, really. But it's also like just respecting somebody else. But I am German, um, and I'm like the latest German that I know. Um, but are they strict? Are they chilled out? Are they friendly? Are they formal? Um, will they work for your homework? Something Gareth said yesterday that made me kind of like <laughs> is um, he said, if you want your tutor to correct your writing, you can't really expect them to like correct an A4 page of your your maybe quite error riddled, maybe perfect writing in another language and give you all these like full on explanations and all that stuff, um, unless you're paying them for their time. Which again, that doesn't mean you, you, you want them to say that took me 45 minutes, that would be this much, but actually what you want is you want to get that plan into place and if writing is a big part of your plan, maybe you don't need as much contact time, but you want to pay them for the corrections and that totally works and then they can come in and say um, okay here's what I keep seeing happening and commas for example in advanced German totally a thing um, and then you can kind of go in and say here's what you keep doing wrong but certainly for me as a tutor if a student does that when a student kind of tells me okay I want you to correct my writing and then we want to get together it helps me so much more because I've actually got something to work with because I don't know what your errors are going to be before you make them Right? Some people make different errors. Um, and that's also, you know, good value for money means letting that person like, listen to you or see your writing, kind of making yourself that vulnerable and then allowing them to correct you and work with you. That is the personalization that you actually want. Um, and number, um, bad mic technique, sorry. And finally, will you use my tools? Um, which means maybe if you're using Anki and Memrise, that kind of thing, some tutors will, you know, like, will use the same, some will have never heard of this. Um, I'm talking about Skype and Google Hangouts or Zoom, like what is your actual technology like? Um, but also textbooks. With all of my long-standing students now, um, we do use textbooks 
because like Gareth said yesterday, I'm, I'm basically repeating Gareth's stuff, but it's like, we're not too cool, we're not too cool, we, we like having textbook, like, man in Texas has a textbook, and I have a textbook in England, that's actually really convenient, because we can just say, look on page so-and-so, instead of emailing links back and forth, or doing the 250 of Google Docs, sometimes it's very convenient. Um, so, will you use my tools, if you've already got a method, and you know I'm going to use Asimil or whatever, Ask them if they've heard of it, ask them if they know the general approach of, you know, Glossika or whatever you are using. Um, that helps just to have that conversation. Now, in a trial, that's, that's all stuff really that you can pretty much sort out via email. Here are a few things that I think you, you want to have a trial. Some tutors call it a trial lesson, others call it a consultation. It tends to be like a little bit of time where you kind of get on the internets with them. Um, and it's either cheap, free, half price, you know, it is a try before you buy. And the four things I would want you to kind of assess there, really, um, and this is really useful for tutors as well. Number one, chemistry, right? And I don't mean like <laughs> H2O, did you know that? No, it's, <laughs> it's, are you, you know, do you feel like you're going to get on with this person? Because, at least for me, when I take on a new student, that's nerve-wracking for the first few weeks at least. I've got like a big like performance uh, angst. Uh, it's, you know, like, like, and equally for the students, you only get to know each other, you're working together on something that really is, you know, like, like we were previously saying, when you're talking a language and you make a lot of mistakes, you sound a bit like an idiot. Um, so this is, chemistry is about do you trust them not to you know, do you trust them to fix your mistakes? Do you get what they're saying? Do you get their sense of humor? Are they a person that you want to spend that time with, that you said you would commit? I think that's important. Um, so chemistry, huge kind of issue. Just like, are you going to get on with them? Are they nice? Are they cool? Um, you could ask them about like their hobbies and things like that, which whatever you want, really. Number two, clear instructions and explanations. So ideally, come with a problem. Say, I don't really get this bit, can you just kind of clarify that for me and see if you understand their explanation, particularly if you want more than conversation practice. But I think even if you want conversation practice, if you're paying someone, they should have a solid knowledge of the language that they are teaching you. Um, this is really important for online lessons. Uh, is your connection working? Because at least in my terms and conditions, I don't really give refunds later. If the, if the connection is terrible, because I just can't afford to do that. It's, the internet is unpredictable, you can't make guarantees, but that <coughs> whole faffing around that you do at the start of a lesson where you go, oh, mm, Skype isn't really, I can't really see you, and oh, you're kind of blurry, and there's a big delay, and let's try Google Hangouts, let's try, mm, that is not really, let's try this system. So all that faffing around with systems, that's trial lesson stuff, in my opinion. That's not... Uh, lesson time that you've then prepped for. So just make sure like they can hear you, they can see you, and you're comfortable with the level of internet connection that you think they have. And it's really weird, like a different online chat, video chat system, like will work differently depending on where you're connecting to. Now that I've said that, it doesn't actually sound that weird. But <laughs> you know, so you might have to cycle through a few is what I'm saying. And then finally, any kind of major terms and conditions, right? So it, it should be written down anyway, but this is stuff like lateness, or can I get my money back if I'm giving you a thousand pounds for the month or something like that. So you just want to be clear on where you're at um, as to people who are like respectfully entering into some level of business agreement together. Okay, so quick summary, how to spend your cash. Number one, be realistic, right? It don't uh, basically don't give anyone money if they say it will beam a language into your brain or something like that. Um, or if you do, tell me how it works out, because <laughs> I may want to sell that too. <laughs> if I, uh, number two, try before you buy. I think that's important. Um, I actually do that on Amazon as well. Like I am actually that person who will like get a refund whenever I can. Um, so before I committed to any specific textbook, I ordered about four on Amazon. Um, and then sent three of them back and kept one and really went, okay, this is the thing that I like. So just be aware that, you know, you've got a try, you've got a right to try before you buy, so do it. Um, use what you buy, right? Who's got a pile of books at home? <laughs> yeah. Um, hope they're from like a charity shop or something. <laughs> um, I, I mean, that's, you know, this isn't the house.
Save money on language learning talk, but just by the way, libraries, hello, libraries, fantastic. Um, but yeah, use what you buy whenever you can. Or if you don't use it, try and work out why it wasn't what you quite were after. And then don't buy that thing again, or that style of thing. And invest, I think, in contact and in interaction. Um, and that's really it. So I'm a quick talker, so I've kind of rushed through it. Are there any, uh, look, it's an emoji. <laughs> Are there any comments, questions, um, experiences, or are we all just taking a break? Uh, can you explain the last bit about the investment and in interaction? Yes, okay, so investing, investing in contact and interaction basically means for most of us, sadly I missed the Latin talk, <laughs> but you know, so it'd be hard to get the Pope on, but um, to me that means when you're putting your money into language learning or you're committing to spend a lot of time on language learning, I think time spent on contact with a native speaker or a tutor, I think is time really well spent and money really well spent because it is part of that commitment and what it gives you is that external structure, that external accountability of somebody, you know, like being around and to be honest, it's not just, oh, they're expecting me to be there at three on a Friday, it's also they now care about whether I achieve this goal. So it's that really. So invest in contact and interaction means don't just rely on like the CD, but try and get something that replies to you. Whether you invest time or money is up to you. Yes. Do you want the mic? I ask you about uh, spending money in intensive courses when somebody gives you a scholarship but you have to pay everything. If they give you a scholarship for one month, study foreign languages in that country in Poland or Czech Republic, but you have to pay the flight ticket and health insurance. And you get money but they give you a scholarship for dorms and Czech language course or Polish language course and they help you a lot of things but uh, also I have to buy the books. But I think it's the best method is to study this language was like this program, intensive course, not uh, one per year, per week. This is like in, in the case of money, mm -hmm. but we have more advancement in a uh, short of time, but I have to continue this approach. What do you think about this intensive courses with scholarships in, the, in foreign country, in Europe? Okay. So what do I think about... Regarding saving money, do you think it's a good uh, way to study language or to give you scholarship to well, I think it's always, a, you know, when someone gives you something for free, it can be good. But I was talking to um, Brian Kwong, his name is, right? The guy from the Ad One Challenge. Um, he's not here. <laughs> but, you know, I was talking to him about the Ad One Challenge yesterday, and he said one of the things that really affects completion rates in the Ad One Challenge is when um, he drops the price. Um, and it doesn't affect them positively. Um, when people spend less money on the Ad One Challenge, they're less likely to complete it. So it's. In that sense, you know the pain of spending um, and the, the pain of investing, it can be a good thing because it challenges you and commits you and you've just got more to lose. But I think, I don't know, I think you were asking about your personal case as far as I can tell. Uh, it was difficult to assess from like the very brief summary that you gave me and I don't want to give personal advice, um, but sounds good. <laughs> The best, best way is to learn the language of the day, not, uh, not uh, one uh, or one per week or two per week, but something more specifically. Yeah. That I place where the language book is more, more improvement and more beneficial, like regarding the money, time, and uh, the stuff. But are you talking about an intensive course where you then kind of go, ho go home and go shrug them? No, no, or I put you later in, uh, in, 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 in other way. I don't know, I feel a high responsibility answering this question. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Some people respond incredibly well to intensive courses. I think most of us do. I mean, I've taken intensive courses at various points in my life and um, say in the French language to get myself up but it was to get up to a level where I can then enter a course that then takes me further um, so I think an intensive course I think it's, it's pretty much what we were saying actually earlier an intensive course is best when you know what it is setting you up to do next so as long as you've got a clarity on that yeah go for it but don't quote me on this <laughs> <laughs> but we have to continue learning this uh, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, most of us will be familiar with this whole like rusty concept where you just, you know, you don't, you 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 snooze, you lose, and you you know, like you don't use, you lose. Use it or lose it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, so I think. An intensive course is particularly useful if it's like a bridge to somewhere, you know, and then you, if you know where you're going afterwards. I think otherwise it really is a bit like if you are wanting to train for a marathon and your marathon is in a year and you go, at Christmas I'm going to run 20 miles and that's it, you know. Even if someone pays for your shoes. Still gonna hurt. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've been tutoring on Italki for uh, more than three years, French, and it's been going on pretty well so far. Uh, but I have some. I've had some students that I'm sure you've had as well who <laughs> who who wants to. It seems like they want to buy the mon the knowledge, you know. They they want to they they give you money and then they say, okay, teach me the language. I and know. Uh, yes, and um, you know what I like uh, in tutoring is that you you're not a teacher; they are not your students. Uh, by the way, I've always had difficulties to call them because they are not my students. I want them to be my friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is really important, I think, is breaking this link with money. Um, to like they learn from from you, you learn from them, and, and that's it. But sometimes it's really hard to tell those students who 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 want to buy really the language um, because you really have to change their mind to say, bro, I'm sorry, it's not gonna be like that. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your the I don't know uh, what. <laughs> but I mean, what would you say uh, to that kind of students who just you have really to change their mind, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh. I guess one thing that helps if you are uh, if you are the tutor because you are ultimately to a certain level you're still in control and you're still like driving this car or whatever metaphor you would like to use. Um, it's there is a level of kind of setting boundaries, especially if you've got somebody for a long, long time. Um, because, like Gareth was saying, if you've got a tutor for a long, long time and you do develop this friendship and this relationship, and especially like I really have to work on this because I'm such a chatty, personable person. You know, like I, I will get into chatting, um, and I found that having the textbooks. And setting, you know, like I, I can write any plan for one of my students. I can write like any plan. Like it can be on Google Docs. It can be on Memrise. It can be like as well researched. And I can work for two hours and write and this whole thing. And I'm be like, and then we're gonna do this. And we're gonna do this. And it'd be awesome. It's personalized. It's great. Do you know? It, do, it, it just doesn't work. I don't know. It's because I made it, and I'm his friend as well as his tutor. And there just isn't. I had to like. I feel like since I've worked with a textbook with this particular person. It's just way better, you know, and I think I, I would call that calling in external, you know, like a little bit of external authority or like a little bit of borrowed authority so that you've got a level of structure. But I think for some of them, it might just be coming back to that need principle that, that Alex was talking about. It's kind of like, why are you doing this? Um, and if you are doing this and if you are, you know, if your goal is to get joy from learning the language, if your goal is to stay in touch with the language, and to just get gradually better, then maybe you're just doing the right thing. It's whether you feel respected by them as a tutor as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, we can't sell them the knowledge. We'd be like, that'd be awesome. But <laughs> sadly not. This is like the sad talk about how you can't sell knowledge. <laughs> okay, are there any more comments? Or? I mean, you might have to stand there. Um, so I haven't received much formal education in another language before, but I'm contemplating um, trying like online tutor, maybe in conjunction with a textbook. Mm -hmm. um, and as you were mentioning that um, it might be important to make sure that your tutor is also willing to use the same tools as you. Mm -hmm. So 
would it be a case of finding the right tutor then seeing what textbook they recommend then you get the textbook or the <coughs> other way around? I've, I've worked with students um, in, in both cases. If you've got your mindset on your textbook and you know this works for me and I'm going to work with this, um, then it's just a case of asking them if they're willing to buy it. You know, and they may just say, okay, yeah, totally going to get this, I'm interested in this too, or maybe you'll just pay for it for them, but textbooks aren't like going to set you back that much and then it's worthwhile. But if they have a legit kind of reason why that particular textbook isn't going to work, like a lot of textbooks are written for group environments. A lot of textbooks are really written for class environments, which means the companion handbook for the teacher that comes with it um, is really nice, but it tells you like, okay, so put everybody into groups of three, then do this with them, then do that with them. And that doesn't work when you're working one-on-one -on -one online. So, you know, I mean, I just overlook that bit and use the parts that I can, but sometimes it is a shame. So they may have something where they're specifically saying, I want to work with you on this, which is designed for a self-guided, you know, a self-guided course. But it's it's a conversation that you should have, and I think definitely, especially if I mean, what is it that you're using? Is it currently is it for written for a class or is it written for a personal? I don't have. I mean, it just started out. So All right. I'm, that's why I have so many choices of which way to go. Yeah, I'd ask them. I'd ask them what they recommend. Yeah, because, I mean, if I don't know if any tutor is a bit like me, but I think we're all like that. I've got like a shelf full at home of stuff and I'm always looking and kind of going, oh, they're doing it this way. So, you know, I've got my personal preferences that I would be able to explain to a student, this one does it this way, this one does it that way, and the different, like, reasons why I prefer one book over another. Hope that helps. Okay, um, just a, a quick note, if you want to read more about this, um, I made like a... Thing. It's, it links to a blog article that I wrote, so if you are kind of looking at more questions that you want to ask a tutor or something like that, there's that. Um, and if you are a tutor and you kind of want to know more about the whole terms and condition things, I made you a voucher, I've got an online course, it's really good, you should take it, it's that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but So I've got various, because I've been blogging from the tutor's perspective, um, mostly about general language learning and self-teaching, um, but you do kind of, when you do this for a while, you do see stuff um, where you go, right, I'm going to write about this once and then everybody will know and that never seems to work, so I've got to promote it more seemingly. Okay, uh, were there any more questions? Hi, I really like your talk, thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. The first question is, what will your what what will you recommend uh, when you're learning several languages at the same time? Like, I sometimes struggle because uh, I've been speaking French for a while, mm -hmm. and I feel like I I've reached a plateau in which I don't see progress. So I had to reach out to mm -hmm. Italki, yeah. and then uh, it's been good. And I try to say I'm gonna commit to it from here to May because I'm gonna do a test. Yes. So it's it's a target. It's measurable. I know I'm, I can I can do this. But then I I I I'm learning German at the same time, and I really wanna speak German. Yeah. Germany. I wanna come and work here. So I have the need for both. Like I'm living and working in France, so I want to improve it. Mm -hmm. But I wanna come to Germany, so I wanna improve it. Yeah. How would you recommend to split your time to do both? <laughs> Or like one for uh. God, this question you really put people on the spot, don't you? Um, <laughs> I mean, in, I think first of all that especially when you're at a more advanced level, something happens where progress is a little bit more invisible, right? So you probably are making progress in French, but it isn't quite as like, all right, tick the box, I know the thing, my doodle or whatever, you know. So that could be a case of stepping up your own tracking method. So maybe you know, like you're looking at the plan, but then also kind of going, okay, I'm going to write down what I learned today, every day for the month or something like that. So you wanna you wanna track your own learning progress a little bit more and just kind of focus on, okay, what have I been actually working on? What have I been actually working on? Because it may just it may be a case of you falling into your comfort zone, which is a good place to be. But if you want to feel progress, it, you know, you kind of need to get a little bit out of that. So try something new, and that could be something where your tutor and you share a Google Doc, you know, and then for the week, 
what it does to kind of do this on a daily basis or on something like that, kind of a more regular, smaller basis, and then getting together with them, maybe even once on, once every two weeks or something like that. I do a lot of work with people where I just want to recognize that they're busy and they've got other things on their mind, and they, this is a top-up kind of session. Um, you know, then you kind of, you send it to them beforehand, maybe ask them to look through it, and ask them if they can see a pattern or ask them to address a specific thing with you. But it, you know, like when you feel like there's no progress, I think tracking can make you remember that you are actually putting the hours in it. It can reduce frustration. Um, and in the case of German, I think that would be a, you know, you may, you know, may want to shake it up and take a group class or something like that, especially at the early levels for beginners German. There's plenty there, which would maybe even help you learn German out of the medium of French, which is like a whole new level of awesome. And then you feel better about your French too. <laughs> yeah, so those are just some ideas. I don't think a one-to-one -one online tutor is always like the solution to everything. Sorry, I'm talking. But um, I, I think it's, you know, it's about knowing all the resources that are on offer for you um, and kind of going back to that, what do I want and how do I want to get there? Not that I ever know what I want. <laughs> <laughs> one last one, and it's about Italki has two, two types of teachers, like informal tutors and full-on language teachers. Yes. What are your thoughts about that? Because I've tried a few, and then some formal teachers are good, but I feel that they've done everything already, and they're like, "You already would. What do you want to do this? Mm -hmm. What tell me? What do you want to? What do you want to improve?" Yeah. So they struggle a little bit. And then I tried the informal ones, and they lack sometimes the formal training on grammar, mm -hmm. but they are polyglots or they're learning languages, so they get it, and they're like, "Okay, we're gonna do this. What do you want to improve?" Like I, I feel more of a connection with them. Yeah. What so, would you recommend? Or so you're saying that both ask you what you want to improve, yes. but you feel like when the formal tutor does it, that's not good. But when the informal tutor does it, that's good. I think the, the informal actually has ideas, or like they get why I wanna get better, or kinda know how, like for example, I had this French um, informal tutor and he said, I'm learning Polish and I know what you feel when you speak and people say, I get you, yeah. so, but I want to be in a point in which people don't hesitate when I speak, mm. that they're not distracted by the accent, they're not distracted by the weird choice of words, okay. so he's like, I know what you mean, so we could kind of do it like this, yeah. so they have more ideas. So they're lining up with you emotionally more as well. Right? Yes. They get your motivation yes. more and kind of get what you're trying and to do. And they're also cheaper because I'm on a budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I can I can speak to I've not I've not done Italki for a while as a tutor, um, so I can speak to how it was like three years ago. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. The big difference between an informal and a formal tutor on Italki is that you have some basic linguistic qualification that you're sending them and they kind of look at it and go, is this a real <laughs> degree or is it a swimming certificate or something? <laughs> you know? I used to work in uni admissions, I've seen a lot of those. <laughs> but um, So I think that comes down to, it, it's not necessarily, and I think that speaks to a, a real truth in hiring a tutor and like the science of hiring a tutor, which is you want to assess your chemistry Right? I think that comes down to the chemistry sense, because I think when you feel like they get me, they're, they're in on this with me, that's a different kind of thing. And it, you know, just because somebody doesn't have like MA teaching things, doesn't mean they can't teach things. Because as we established, you can't teach stuff anyway. <laughs> you know? So it is, it is about who you, who you get on with. I don't think, if you have found like the person where you, that you want to work with um, for a little while, on Italki, in the informal tutor section, I don't feel you need to feel like you're missing out by not having a formal tutor. But largely, I would expect anyone who's got like that formal qualification to be a little bit more trained in the sense of curriculum development, kind of knowing like you know what's expected, to maybe be a bit more familiar with the standard exams that there are, um, and finally to be able to explain grammar points on demand when they come up. I think I've got to finish. So, thank you. Thank you.